I've got to mention league tables. Unfortunately, they permeate the globe, right? So actually, anywhere you are in the world, you probably know about them if you're in, at all interested in higher education. Either UK league tables or international league tables, they are all nonsense. It is so frustrating that our fate is so tied to them. And again, as a scientist, they're very unsatisfying. I cannot stress this enough. I'm looking right down the barrel of this lens. They are nonsense. You're physicists, right? I think most of the people watching this are, are, are interested in physics, are pretty numerate, are interested in, you know, really quantitative analysis, are interested in the numbers. The problem with league tables is it's all pseudo-statistical, full quantitative nonsense. Let me explain. There are various organizations who create, you know, who go out and collect a whole load of data kind of put all that data into a machine, turn a handle and use it to tell you which in some sense is the best university. Um, and that's really all there is to it. And then obviously they then, you know, they publish these lead tables and people then use them for making decisions about which universities they want to go to or which universities they want to do research in or whatever. We think a lot about how we combine data. We think a lot about error bars and significant figures. And you lose so much of that when you distill all of these really different numbers, some of which are quite arbitrary and end up with quite a, a, you know, a final score that you then rank institutions by. And there's no, there's no sense of, of, of scale or, or separation between them. So I guess, okay, there are two issues. Firstly, there's kind of a practical issue and there's a fundamental issue, right? The practical issue is you have to ask who's making these league tables and what's in it for them those organizations which tend to be newspapers like the guardian like the times like the times higher education like the independent like, like other um, organizations there's also something called qs especially in the uk a lot of them are actually made by newspapers and the reason why they produce league tables every year is because they want to sell newspapers and so they put out a new league table every year and do you know worried parents go out and buy it or prospective students go out and buy it and to see which is this year's best university and that means that they actually have a vested interest in volatility right because actually if this year's league table is just the same as last year's league table there's no point in publishing a new one and there's no headline they can put down that says this year the University of X is the best university in the country because it's the same university as it was last year. So they have this vested interest in keeping the pot stirring and keeping things changing and coming up with new algorithms every year. So there's kind of that churn that they just generate just in the nature of what they're trying to achieve with their league tables. And the issue is how do they do that ranking? The more fundamental thing is you're kind of trying to order something which is fundamentally unorderable, right? You're trying to, because the, it's a meaningless question to say what's the best university, because the, you know best for what, right? It just depends what you're trying to measure. But a lot of these league tables do do it by school or topic, don't they? Which has got the best physics department? Which is yes, yes, yeah. No, you can subdivide it down, you can, down to to you know individual subjects, but you still got the same problem, right? In the yeah, okay, you've kind of narrowed things down a bit, but you still. What do you mean when you say best physics department? I mean, obviously, you know, University of Nottingham has the best physics department in the world. Everyone knows that, but why? What is it that you're actually measuring? It's just unsatisfying when you think of people making decisions as individuals. And I have now talked to thousands of students over the years, and every single one of them has had a different motivation, a different set of criteria for what they want out of a university. So here's just one example. This is something called the Research Excellence Framework. And this is not a media, this is actually done, it's essentially done by scientists, it's essentially done by people in the community, in this case, physicists who judge and rank different universities. Obviously it doesn't just happen for physics, it happens for all the other subjects and all the other disciplines, but we're gonna focus on physics. And it also decides how a big lump of cash from the government is divvied up between different, different departments. So this is a big deal. We're here at Nottingham. Nottingham, in the last research excellence framework, um, came in at number seven, right? Last time round we were at number three, so joint third. Just above us is the University of Portsmouth. Great, great university, and you can see they're doing pretty well. However, what, what is that ranking based on? We got 3.57. They got 3.58. 
Here's the question you should always ask yourself when it comes to league tables and rankings like this. What is the uncertainty? What is the error bar? And if you can't even think about how that error bar would be calculated, that's giving you a big hint that this stuff is really needs to be considered very, very carefully and not read at face value. Cause is the error bar here at the plus and minus 0 0.01 level? If it is, then you, Ports, you can't distinguish between Portsmouth and Nottingham. If it's at a higher level, then you can't distinguish. Here we've got 3.58, 3.57, 3.53. How do you distinguish? When physicists who are numerate place any credence in this, it's really concerning. So that's to say they collect all these bit, various bits of information and then they come up with some algorithm that combines all this information to create a single number associated with every university and then whoever has the highest number wins, right? And that's the one you put at the top. Right? Individually, they're all quite sensible. They're things like, um, what are the outcomes like in terms of what, whether the students get jobs or not? What's the staff-student ratio like? But then there are other things like expenditure per student. You know, and, and again, you, naively, you might think, OK, so if a university is spending more money per student, that's probably going to be a better experience for the student. So you end up in this ridiculous situation where if you had two universities that had identical outcomes in terms of quality of education, quality of research going on, all the various things they're measuring, the one that would finish higher in the league table is the one that costs more to produce it because that's the spend per student. That's the amount of money that's going in which you know, is clearly a nonsense, right? That's because they're clearly a less efficient university because they've got exactly the same outcomes, but they cost more. I would say approach it like a scientist. You know, it's, it's a table of numbers. Some of those numbers might be useful to you. Some might not. Some might have a limited amount of reliability. And so it's really up to you to look with a skeptical scientific eye to find out whether that league table is telling you anything that is useful to you. I can choose any number of different league tables and pick out a university. So here we're seventh. This is the um, complete university guide. So this obviously has got, got to be one. So where are we? Um, we're not seventh. Um, where are we? Oh, we're 16th. Right, so and Portsmouth was one. So let's just check. So Portsmouth was one place above us here. Where's Portsmouth? No, they are. All right, let's just, just make sure they're not here, are they? Nope. There we are. Uh, 19 places below us. So on this league table, the one place above us, here are the 19 places below us. I can take any of these league tables and basically shuffle them around. And my colleague, Mike Merrifield, a uh, um, 60 simple stalwart, wrote an absolutely brilliant blog post. Here's the league table placings and how they vary from year to year. Let's just tra track one of these. So we start down here, and we go snakes and ladders all the way up the ladder. Then next year we drop down, and then we come up again, and then next year we're all the way down. That's not signal, that's noise. That's pure noise. Don't believe the league tables. This feels a bit like sour grapes though, because Let's look at the Olympic Games. Someone has to win the 100 metre sprint. Someone will win yeah, it by 100 from a second. It's defined, but, 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 a, week, a, well, but a week before, but, another one could have won. But the error bar, I can give you an error bar on that, Brady. It's a great point. It's a really, really good point. But I can give you an error bar, two plus or minus whatever, a millisecond. We can do that. What is the error? That's the point. When you rank these things, what is the error bar on those numbers? There's no error bar in the Precisely. 100 metre sprint. Oh, there, there is. No, there's not. But we can time it. Of course there is. You could go over the athletes' races over the last 10 years, average them out, and then give the gold medal based on that. But we don't do that. We just say, on, on a given day, there was a winner and a loser, and I'm afraid you get the gold medal and you get the silver. That's what's happening here. No. On, on this given day... Got to, got to disagree. The, but the problem with the race analogy is that is well-defined. They cross the line in a certain time. That time we can measure down to milliseconds, right? So it's a well-defined number. They're measuring defined things here. You just don't like the things they're defining. No, they're not. So they're measuring, for example, one of the things that really feeds into this is whether papers are four star, three star, two star, and one star. There have been multiple um, uh, studies of this which show that the error bar is that if you give an individual paper um, to a number of different experts and ask them to review it, the best you'll do is plus or minus a star. Okay, well now we're just comparing it with gymnastics or diving instead of sprinting, where there's a little bit of judge's opinion 
getting into it. But but it's still you just have to you just have to accept it. You just have to accept the umpire's decision. No, that's that's where we disagree, Brady. Because if we're saying that we are basing these rankings and the numbers are there in many of these and percentages are there and different um, rankings are made on the basis of those numbers, we're physicists, we're scientists. Those numbers have to mean something and so often they don't mean anything. Sport has league tables. Manchester City won the Premier League last season and the season before. <laughs> like, some people will say... Yeah, but that doesn't mean they're the best team. Like, you know, other teams can be unlucky or more exciting to watch. You know, they, you know, people will always argue their team's better for some reason. I guess my argument would be that, you know, that, that, you, that sports and education should be trying to do two completely different things, right? Sports is there for ent entertainment. And if it's entertaining people, then it's meeting its, its purpose, right? Universities are not supposed to be about entertainment. They're supposed to be about making the country better, educating people, discovering new things, doing research, coming up with new drugs to save people's lives, all that kind of stuff. And so actually, anything which kind of distracts from that real mission, and these things do distract from that mission in the sense that universities are spending money on gaming these systems, on employing people to figure out how to do better at them. Um, that's money that's being wasted out of the system. And so it really means that, you know, it really is fundamentally different from a sports league table. Plus, actually, you know, the team that stop, finishes top of the league table, it finishes top of the league table for one reason, right? Which is that it's, you know, it's acquired the largest number of points in a very simple, objective way. Whereas what these university league tables are doing is mishmashing all sorts of things together to try and create a league, an order of something which fundamentally doesn't have an order to it. So I guess there's two, you know, I have two, two counter arguments to you. One is that what it's fun, fundamentally what it's trying to do is flawed and different from what happens in sports. But also it matters in a different sort of way. Putting that all to one side, the reason I'm bringing this up is just to plead with students, don't make your decisions on the basis of positions in league tables because A, which league table, and B, how have they put those numbers together, and C, these league tables are put together by... Uh, media organisations who have a massively vested interest in selling the story. If the league table placements, and this is a point Mike makes, were basically static from year to year, there's no news in that, but, oh, University of X has, has shot up the league table by 20 positions, that's news. Professor, in the UK we have an organisation called Ofsted that rates schools, it gives them ratings, if whether, you know, how good they are, excellent, you know, almost like star ratings. That's a neutral organisation. That's not owned by a newspaper. Does uni do universities have something like that? And should they? Would that be a better way of doing it? Have like an independent umpire? Which we do have. So there's this thing called the Office for Students, which looks after students uh, and um, you know, makes sure their interests are represented. And there is this thing called the Teaching Excellence Framework, TEF, which is rates every university around the country. You know, it's been running quite a while now. And it's, again, it's one of these things that keep tweaking it. The problem with it is that, so, for example, the, the, the last implementation of TEF used a, a scale from one to four stars. Right? And the problem with that is you create these enormous kind of cliff edges, right, in that if somewhere's got, just got four stars, whereas somewhere just failed to get four stars, suddenly it looks like this university is way better than this university. So even systems like that, which look like they're, you know, and, and in some sense it's more sensible because you're not, you, you avoid one of these issues, which is, well, okay, you know, you just don't have that fine gradation of scale, which is clearly nonsense. But the, the flip side to that is by not having that fine gradation of scale as you create these cliff edges where someone's just below one level, somebody's just above it. Um, so even that system doesn't work particularly well. Phil, you were once the admissions tutor here, and it was your job to get people to come here. Did you ever use a, a good position for Nottingham on a league table to sell the university? So what I said, great question, Brady. Thank you. One of the years, we were number five. And I said, look, Nottingham's number five. Where were we last year? 18th. Right? What did we do differently to move from 18th position to fifth? Did we bring in a superstar research group? No. Did we up the number of teaching staff? No. Did we improve the facilities dramatically? No. They changed the, um, the way they calculated the numbers. That's the only reason. And you didn't use that number five position? I, tr I said, here's where we are now, but I said last year we were here. So don't buy into the numbers. 
I agree in terms of sour grapes. If I was coming from a position of we're always ranking low, but I can pick, I can do what every university does. I'll pick out the, the league tables where Nottingham does well and ignore the ones where Nottingham, but that's dis bloody honest. It's dishonest, and if we're talking about critical thinking, and that's what universities are here for, we shouldn't be doing this. Because I find this really interesting, right? Because you, you talk about how these league tables distill all this subtle information, and it all gets lost and fuzzy and full of errors by the time it... But in your job, you, do, you kind of do that, don't you? You look, at, you look at these intricate, complicated galaxies, and you classify them, that's an A galaxy, and that's a B galaxy, and like you, you kind of do that a lot. And then we write a whole paper about all the things that we miss by doing that sort of classification. There's always a discussion. There's always a context given. And you're not deciding to go and live in that galaxy for three <laughs> years as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then even then, people argue about it because that's what science is all about. I think you're right. Those league tables... I would probably use them in the absence of any other information. They're a shortcut, but they're a shortcut that might lead you in the wrong direction. What do you say to someone who says, you just don't like being appraised or critiqued or ranked? Like, you can't handle the spotlight. You, uh, you want to be left alone and not, not compared to no, anyone else because it might make you look uh, bad. No, our entire life is appraisal. Submitting papers, you get reviewers' comments back. You don't but, like that process either. No, I don't mind that. No, 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 no. That process, um, peer review, I think it's pretty important. I would say every single paper we've, not every single, no, 95% of the papers we've published have been improved by peer review. But that's a process of where somebody's actually read and engaged with the material, and it's not reduced. The peer review process is not reduced to a league table. You get feedback, you get stuff and a lot more um, insight beyond headline figures. So, moreover, when you submit grant proposals, yes, it can be, again, coming back to the failure side of things, there's nothing worse than working for six months on a grant proposal, submitting it, and it not making it past peer review and not getting funded. So, yeah, I, or, I think academics' life, as in many jobs, is all about sort of responding to failure. You recently retired. You're an emeritus professor now here at Nottingham. <laughs> So you've got a little bit of extra time on your hands. If the Prime Minister or the King came to you and said, we want to create new league tables, we want them to be neutral, we don't want them to be associated with any newspaper, we're going to put you in charge of the system, you come up with the algorithm, you come up with a way of creating the league table, do you think you could do it? Do you think you could come up with a way to make it kind of work, to make it useful? I'm honestly not sure. So there, are, you know, so there is one league table which kind of comes close, and you're going to ask me what it's called, and I can't for the life of me remember. I'll check it out for you afterwards. We'll put it on the screen when Professor remembers. He's old now. He doesn't Thanks. remember things. I don't remember these things anymore. Anyway, but there is this one league table where, you remember I said you take a whole bunch of different things and you kind of, you know, they all get combined together to create this one number. What this league table does is it, it has the individual things for all the individual bits and pieces, and, it, and then it leaves to the person who's actually consulting the league table, what weighting they want to put on different things. And so that way they can decide actually what's really important to me is that it's, you know, it has a very high value added score, or it's a university which is at a, at a campus rather than a city centre or, you know, so you, the whole bunch of different things that, that the person can kind of combine for themselves to decide what the, how much weight to give to the different factors. Sort of a do-it-yourself algorithm. It is, yeah, and, you, uh, and that really does tailor it to the individual of this is important, this is not important. That's a better way of doing it because, because it does mean that not everyone gets the same answer. Um, I, I still don't think it's kind of perfect because it still gives the impression that there is a right answer and there really isn't, you know, in that objective sense of this is the right answer for me. Um, but I think that kind of approach might be a better way of doing it than just publishing a list, you know, that's printed in a newspaper somewhere. So do you think universities should never be compared to each other empirically? I No, I would disagree with that. I would say they should be compared and there should be, a, in terms of how that research funding is divvied up, we need to think about how we do that. But this is not the way to do it. This really isn't the way to do it. What is the way to do it? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, I would say in terms of um, making it the, the, the process a lot more robust is get rid of the numbers, get rid of the rankings, get rid of the, the league table mentality.
I, I always ask my new 2Ts why they chose this place. Um, partly because I want to know. I want to know how we can make things better. And one thing that really stuck in my mind was someone said, well, I, I had a two-week internship at a different institution that I'm not going to name. And it was the place I really thought I wanted to go. And they said, but the whole time I was there, nobody smiled at me. And I came to visit here and it was just so welcoming and so friendly. And I just got a feeling, I just got a feeling I could really be happy here. So we have this thing in, on the research side of things called the San Francisco Declaration that a lot of universities have signed up to now, which says that we won't use the various, you know, on the research side, we won't use some information that we know to be flawed to make decisions. So there's this thing called the impact factor of a journal, which is, you know, it's supposed to be some measure of how good a journal it is. It, again, it's something that can be gamed. And so, you know, it's just not something you should be relying on. Universities actually recognize this and, and have signed up to this thing that says, we will not use this impact factor. We will not use it for deciding whether to promote people or what decisions we're making and all those kinds of things. I would really like to see them make a similar commitment on the, on the league table side of things that says, we know these things are bad, we know they're flawed, therefore we're not going to engage with them, we're not going to use them in our publicity material, we're not going to put up big posters saying ranked third in the country for something or other, we're not going to pay the company's consultancy fees to try and move our positions up these league tables. So just basically signs up to saying, we recognise these things are bad and therefore we've all agreed not to play their game. Signing that declaration is pretty pointless, though. I mean, you need the students, the prospective students, to sign it, and they're not going to all sign up to it. They're, they're still going to use them. Uh, they, they will, but I, I think you can just undermine the credit because when universities crow about the fact they've finished top of a league table, they're adding credibility to those league tables by saying so. They're saying, you know, here's something we trust, which is saying we're good. Right? Um, and it's dishonest, right? Because we don't trust them, really. We know they're, they're bad. We know they're flawed. We know they're a bad way of doing things, but we play that game. If we can you know, stop reinforcing the credibility of these league tables by using them in our own advertising, there's at least a chance that students will realise that they're bad too. For more videos we made exploring some of these topics, including the UK's university clearing system and how Professor Moriarty dealt with his own failures at university, check out the video description. I'll also link to more videos and resources you might find interesting. And the first question to ask is, when you put it down onto a surface and the cage bonds to the surface, does the molecule inside, does the water molecule feel the effect of the surface?